at this way instead. All right, is that a little better? All right, good to see you here this morning. Uh, we're looking forward to worshiping God in his house today. And uh, thank you for coming out here on this rainy Sunday. And uh, I think this afternoon we're going to have a, it's been kind of a, a, a rough morning weather-wise, but I think we're going to have a, a beautiful day uh, afternoon for graduation today. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, spending some time uh, just uh, blessing Molly today, um, at graduating uh, the, today at Putnam County and many others as well in our community. Um, so why don't we pray for them right now and uh, we'll open our service a word of prayer and we'll pray for those who are graduating um, here today. And uh, Brother Ian Gilworth, would you please lead us in prayer, sir? Amen. We're going to continue to sing together this morning. Brother Martin, why don't you come along? Why don't you use that today? Is that okay if you use that? All right. Or nothing at all. Well, I think folks would like to hear you better than not. So, um, all right. Well, um, we're going to continue to sing together this morning as Brother Marty leads us. Appreciate Jan uh, being here today as well. And we're getting ready for Vacation Bible School. She brought in a whole load of items uh, for VBS. And over the next few weeks, we're going to start pounding the pavement about that, getting ready for Vacation Bible School. So thanks so much, Jan, for playing today. Standing for, for this song, 30, number 38, How Great Thou Art, verses 1, 3, and 4 of number 38. <laughs> God, the only God, thankful for him. 
Um, Nick Salt, um, The Love of God, number 130. 130. Uh, I'll turn it there in case the words are up there. But we're thankful for the blood of Christ, the first song, then the greatness of God, then the love of God, verses 1 and 3. Remain standing for this song as well. Seventy-eight. It is well with my soul. Verses one, three, and four. Number four hundred and seventy-eight. Oh. 
singing, Pastor. We're going to dismiss them. microphone situation figured out here in a little bit guys but we're going to dismiss the kids for children's church at this time uh if you uh little ones to be uh dismissed now uh brother robert and uh, miss carolyn hauser have got you guys squared away for children's church today and uh they are actually um while we're here in the auditorium going through the book of genesis um, the kids are going through the book of Genesis right now as well. They're working through some stories there, uh, creation and Adam and Eve and things like that. So uh, good things going on up there in Children's Church and appreciate all those who uh, work with our kids uh, from week to week. But uh, let's go ahead and give our tithes and offerings to the Lord at this time. If I could get some gentlemen to help me uh, with passing the plates, that would be great. Um, let's uh, thank the Lord for the, uh, the funds that he's provided for us and let's worship him through the offering plate um, as we pass it here this morning. And uh, let's pray together. Brother Jimmy, would you please lead us in prayer, sir? Let's get started here today in our Bible study by going to Genesis chapter 9. If you turn there with me, Genesis chapter 9. I'm going to continue to study together uh, through uh, the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 9. And I just want to say thank you to everybody who's been praying for uh, my family this week. Um, Heather and I got the opportunity to go down to Alabama. Uh, oh, we left Tuesday night um, and then got we drove through the night because we thought with uh, the, the four-year-olds in tow, we thought that might be a little bit uh, easier just to drive through the night, let them sleep while we drove. That worked out beautifully. Um, they performed admirably on the trip. So they did great. I was so impressed and so pleased with that. Um, they could have made it really hard on us, but they, they went easy. But uh, we got down there Wednesday afternoon and got to spend some time with my dad in the hospital on Wednesday and Thursday. And they released him Friday uh, from the hospital. So he's home now and uh, doing okay. He's tired. Um, being in the hospital for 11 straight days will do that to you. Um, they don't let you get a lot of rest in those places, but uh, he's doing pretty well, um, all things considered, and uh, they did confirm while we were there. We already knew uh, we already knew it, but uh, they did confirm positively that he does have colon cancer, um, so um, would appreciate your prayers there about that. Um, he has decided not to seek treatment um, for it. Um, chemotherapy would be um, the, the the treatment for it, and he just felt like with uh, being 80 years old, uh, COPD on top of it, um, he's lost probably 60, 70 pounds over the past uh, few months just with a couple hospital stays he's had, and he wasn't eating solid food leading up to this past hospital stint, and so um, just not in a place where that would be a good idea, and we kind of agreed with him on that, that, um, you know, out of, when you've got COPD and heart issues and things like that, uh, colon cancer might be the least of his concerns, but um, we know that um, that time's limited now, so um, we don't know how aggressive the, the cancer is. Um, it could go on and go on and not really do anything, could, might not advance, so um, we just appreciate your prayers uh, that way that uh, the cancer would not advance um, any more than it already has um, and that his COPD and all of that would stay um, um, where it is today, that he would have um, a lot of good days left. He just wants to enjoy the time that he's got left and not be sick and, and all the things that come with chemotherapy. For many, that's, a, that's exactly what you need to do. Um, but for some, it's not always the best option, and he feels like he's one of those, those folks that he just needs to take a different route. So we're going to try to get back down there later this summer for just a regular vacation, not just as a whirlwind trip driving down Tuesday and coming back on Friday. So 
um, pretty quick. We're going to try to stay a little bit longer later this summer and just get to see everybody, not just my, my parents and my family, but um, everybody down there. So um, we're going to try to enjoy them as much as we can while we're down there. But again, thank you for your prayers for us. Thank you for your prayers for my dad. And uh, if anything changes along those lines, we'll, we'll let you know. We'll keep you updated. But um, let's get into our study here today. Genesis chapter 9. Um, I'm thankful for life, aren't you? I'm thankful that God gives us life however long it is or however short it is. I guess that depends on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, whether life is long or short. Um, But um, I'm thankful for every day that we get. It's a gift from God. And uh, even the very fact that you're here today is is uh, God's grace. Uh, God has given you grace uh, to be here today. In Genesis chapter 9, we're actually going to talk about that a little bit, the idea of life and the importance and the blessing, the gift that life is. Genesis chapter 9, verse number 8 is where we're going to begin our reading here today. It tells us here, And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you of the fowl of the cattle and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bows shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Let's pray together and we'll ask God to help us as we study this passage. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for everybody that's able to make it out today uh, to Midway. And Lord, for those that aren't able to be here in person, Lord, we pray your blessings upon them as well. And Lord, many going through struggles, difficulties right now. God, we pray for an extra measure of grace and mercy upon their lives today. Just be near to them um, in their difficulties. And uh, Lord, uh, today, as we go through the scriptures, I pray that we would, as we close out this story of of Noah and uh, his life and all that he experienced uh, that you tell us in your word. God, I pray that uh, our hearts would be arrested by the word of God, that as we read today, that we would not just see Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth and Noah's wife and uh, the the son's wives there, but Lord, may we see ourselves in the passage as well. May we see our experiences, our difficulties, our struggles, and Lord, our world today um, as we read this passage of scripture together. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in hearts Uh, Lord, we believe that you are the real preacher. You're the real teacher here this morning. So, Lord, hide me behind the cross of Jesus Christ, and may it be just Jesus Christ that uh, is seen and heard here this morning through the word of God. And we'll thank you for all that you do. For it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we ask these things. Amen. Amen. There was a a biology one uh, student who was taking an exam And one of the questions that was asked on that exam was, suppose you could uh, go to Mars and take any laboratory equipment that you used in this Biology 1 course. So imagine you could go to Mars and take any equipment from this classroom to Mars with you to look for life. How would you determine that there was, whether or not there's life on Mars? How would you use the instruments? How would you use the tools that we used in this class to search for life on Mars? A student read that question, and he responded this way. He said, ask the inhabitants. Even a no would be significant. He got an A on that. He got an A on that test um, because there's just something special about life. And that's what God's going to tell us about here in Genesis chapter 9. This chapter is God's homage. It's his memorial to life and how precious and wonderful it is. And that's interesting because we've just read Genesis 6, 7, and 8 where God has judged the entire world and removed it um, of, pretty, of almost all life except for the life that's on the ark. That's Noah and his family and the animals that are on the ark with them, those creatures. The world has, been, uh, ha- has had life stripped from it 
But here in Genesis chapter 9, God reminds us that he didn't do this out of a, a feeling of hatred. He didn't do this out of a feeling of resentment uh, towards the creation that he made. He's telling us here in Genesis chapter 9 that he, in fact, loves life. He loves the, the life that we get to live and that the creatures of this world, uh, he loves the fact that we are here and that we exist. And so God does something here. He makes a covenant. He makes a covenant to prove that fact. Genesis chapter 8, when we finished up last week, we saw God talking to himself. And when God talks to himself, it's a little different than when you talk to yourself, right? When you and I talk to ourselves, we're working on something, right? We're thinking through something. You ever talk to yourself out loud accidentally you know you ever talk to yourself out loud accidentally and somebody saw you do that a little embarrassing right but when God talks to himself it's different right because God isn't a single person God is a trinity he's a triunity three persons in one being that we call God Yahweh the the Lord is uh, a unity of persons and so when God speaks to himself he's speaking amongst the members of the trinity and so he vocalizes in Genesis chapter 8 out loud God states I will not judge the earth this way again and remember we talked about last week that that was God's way of making it official that was God's way of making this a, uh, an authoritative statement because God has said it out loud, therefore it's going to happen this way. Now in Genesis chapter 9, God shares this promise that he has made amongst himself. He shares this promise with Noah and his family and he explains to them how this is going to work out as a promise that life will be preserved that life is going to be protected by God. All right, so he opens up this chapter, though, with a new command. Verses 1 through 7, we see God making um, a new command here. Look at verse number 1 of Genesis 9. It says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Well, where have we heard that before? That sounds familiar when we read that, that goes all the way back to the beginning, in the literal beginning, when God created Adam, and he told him that and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, fill the earth with people, populate the earth with people, God's treasured possession, God's treasured creation, this human race. God says, go and do that. And God makes this promise, or I'm sorry, this command here to Noah and to his family because... They're the only ones left. So he reiterates, he doubles down on the command and says, I want you to go repopulate this earth. God's showing them here that I'm not wiping the earth clean and, and removing it of all life and removing it of all people. I want you to exist. I want you to be here. I want people around. And so he gives them this command to populate the earth with more people, to begin again. And so in this way, Noah is sort of a, a, a new Adam. He is a, a new Adam. And, and by the way, this comes back again to the fact that we're either going to take the Bible literally and believe what it says, or we really can't believe any of it. Because what we read here in Genesis 9 is that we have a new Adam on the scene, Noah and his family. So if we say in our minds, if we surrender Genesis 1, 2, and 3 and say, well, that's not literal history. That's just um, a story. That's God using a pattern or it's a story that's meant to show the whole human race or something like that. If we surrender that and say, we're not going to take that literally, well, are we going to take Genesis 9 literally? Because if the whole earth wasn't descended from one person in, or one family through Adam, then certainly if we believe Genesis 9 to be true, and that God had this conversation with Noah, then we certainly did descend from this family, or are we going to surrender that as well? And so again, if we surrender Genesis 1, you have to surrender Genesis 2, and if you surrender Genesis 2, you have to surrender Genesis 3, and then 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, all the way down through about chapter 11, the first 11 chapters of the Bible become meaningless if we're not going to take the Bible at face value, if we're not going to believe what it says. So God tells him, uh, Noah, your family is going to be the ancestors for the human race. The human race. 
All right, so he tells us here, though, there's going to be a, he makes a promise of fear, a promise of fear. Verse number two, he says, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. So he tells them here that they're going to be afraid of you, that the creatures of this world are going to be afraid of you. They're going to shy away from you and try to avoid you. And you know what? I have a hard time blaming them for that. Because after all, up to this point, mankind has created nothing but trouble and problems and chaos for the creatures of this world. We plunged them into the curse. We've gotten them destroyed and wiped off the face of the earth, many species of them, because of the flood. So why wouldn't they be afraid of the human race? We've been nothing but trouble for them. And so he tells them here, Noah, they're going to be afraid of you. And by the way, that's just me commenting on that I don't I that's not necessarily why God said that but um, there was apparently up to this point less fear from the animal kingdom there was apparently less concern less dread uh, from the animal kingdom but not after the flood everything's going to change after this point once Noah gets off of the boat and the animals depart what maybe God put some sort of um, touch on these animals to to make them docile and kind while they were on the boat for a year and now God's saying no more these are they're going to be afraid of you they're going to run away from you the fear and the dread of you will be upon all the animals of the earth we don't know uh, if that's the case maybe that's what's going on but there's a promise of fear that God makes here but then God then tells Noah he gives him a prerogative to feed a prerogative to feed he continues on in the verse and he says into your hand are they delivered? Why are they afraid of you? Because you're going to hunt them. You're going to use them for meat and for food. Verse 3, it says, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. So God tells them here, he approves of man um, dining upon animal, eating out of the animal kingdom. Now surely up to this point that was already going on. But at this point, God gives his stamp of approval upon it. God says, this is fine, Noah. It's fine for you to to eat this way, to be carnivorous, to get out there and and eat the animals that God has created. And praise the Lord. Isn't that great news? That's awesome. That's one of my favorite verses in the Bible because I I like that kind of stuff. I like meat. Um, And if you're a vegetarian or vegan or something like that, that's okay. You can be that way and still be right with God. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with that necessarily. Um, I just I, I just feel for you. I really do. You're missing out. It's awesome. It's so awesome. I heard this week that uh, there, I didn't even know this existed, but apparently they've created a burger called the Impossible Burger. Have you heard about this? It is a completely vegetarian burger that is supposed to taste exactly like real meat. And I, I don't know, I haven't had one yet, but I guess Burger King's coming out with it, and you can go to different restaurants and get it. You can't go to the store and buy it yet, but you can get it at a restaurant, and they say it tastes exactly like it. In fact, it, some people, when you put them side by side, and people eat the real burger, and then they eat the Impossible Burger, they think the Impossible Burger is the real meat, and the real meat is the, the, the vegetarian burger. So it actually tastes better than real burgers. I, I don't know how that works. But let me, just, let me just shine a light on that. Let's think about that for a minute. If you're a vegetarian or a vegan, why would you want to eat a burger that tastes exactly like a burger? That's not really the point, is it? So that just tells you how wonderful it is that God has allowed us uh, to do this thing, to feed uh, this way. And we've been doing it ever since. All right. So then he continues on here, though. We're not going to spend much more time there, although I I, I like to talk about food. But we're going to move on. And we're going to see here that God gives a purpose for government. A purpose for government. He continues on here, and he says in verse number 4, But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. Well, what does that mean? A lot of people have a different opinion on this, different thoughts on this. Probably what I think he's talking about here is don't eat the animal while it's still alive. I think that's what he means by this, the flesh with the life thereof. And I think we all get that, right? That makes a a lot of sense to us. Maybe not so much back in this era, but it makes sense to us that you wouldn't do that. Uh, But verse number 5, he says, Surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast, 
will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. So this is an interesting statement by God. God says that when an animal takes the life of a human being, God takes notice of that. That's an important and significant thing to God. Huh. That's interesting because when I look at our culture today and somebody gets hurt like a hunter uh, will get hurt out hunting some uh, dangerous game like a bear or something like that, you hear a lot of people cheer about that and celebrate the fact that the hunter got hurt by the animal. Well, that's not the heart of God. That's not the heart of the Lord. God does not celebrate when that happens, and he's going to tell us why here in just a minute. But then he carries on and he says, not only am I going to be upset when that happens in the animal kingdom, but when you do it to one another, when you are shedding each other's blood as human beings, he says, I will require that, meaning I'm going to hold you to account for that. That's not something I'm just going to gloss over. It's not something that you can, um, you can just excuse away. When you unjustly hurt someone else, then God says you will be held to account for that. Okay, so he says here in verse number 6, Whoso sheddeth man's blood by uh, man shall his blood be shed, for in, in the image of God made he man. And you be, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. So what God is saying here is that you need somebody to uh, oversee how people treat each other. You need some organization to handle when uh, things get out of hand, when people start taking advantage of one another, when people start abusing and mistreating each other. There needs to be something to hold those people to account. And so God creates an institute, well, he didn't create, but institutes and approves of what we call governments. Government. That is the role of government according to God, is to punish the evildoer, to punish the person who takes advantage of his neighbor, to punish the person who, uh, who unjustly uh, takes life. He says here that, if, um, that, that, that we need this to take place. And I think the reason he says this is because Genesis 6, we see a world without that structure. We see a world without proper God-given authority. And what happened? The earth was filled with violence, so much so that the, they were going to eradicate even the godly line of Seth and his family. And so God says, we need something to protect the innocent from the evildoer. And so God institutes here government. And again, just like animals were probably consumed before the flood, there was government before the flood as well, but now God approves of it. He puts his stamp of approval on it and says, that's good. You need to have this in place. So we need to understand something. All authority ultimately rests with God, right? All authority falls under God's hand. God is the judge of all the earth. He is the ultimate authority. Now what we see here in Genesis 9 is important because God is now delegating some of that authority to mankind. He's taking some of his authority and he says, I'm going to let mankind carry out some of my authority. Certainly, when a person does something to take advantage of, of someone else, God sees that as sin and he's going to hold that person to account for that, right? We, we believe that God is a just God and that justice must be done. And so that person will either pay for that themselves or they have to surrender to Jesus Christ and accept his forgiveness for that. But it has to be dealt with one way or another. It's got to be dealt with. So God says that authority that he has, he's going to delegate some of that to the human race in this thing that we call government. So that government will hold us to account for the crimes that we commit against one another. And, and we're getting somewhere with this, okay? So hang on. Um, th this is important and this is valuable for us. We need to understand that God is not just our maker. He is also our master. And so if somebody acts in defiance to God's commands, they are working against God. When somebody lives in defiance to God-given authority. They are living in defiance of God. 
because God delegated some of that authority, delegated some of that uh, to this thing that we call government. Go over to Romans chapter 13 with me. It'll be on the screen too, but I'd like you to look at this with me. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, verse number 1. Romans chapter 13, verse number 1. It says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. I lied, it's not on the screen, so you're going to have to look at your Bible. Sorry. Romans 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So what he's saying here is that, again, as we just said, all authority rests in God's hands. Because he is the creator, he is the maker, and he is the master of this world and this universe. So he says that if there is a a power that exists, then that is something that God has decreed. That is something that God has ordered into place. A lot of people will read this and say, well, we shouldn't even care about voting. We shouldn't even care about uh, the democratic process because God's just going to decide it anyways. I don't think that's at all what he's saying. When he's talking about the powers that be, he's not saying the president who's in place right now. He's saying the fact that you have a government over you that acts as an authority over your life, God has ordained that to exist. God sets up kingdoms and tears them down. But as far as God picking and choosing who is the, you know, the, the, the representative from the third district of Missouri, I don't think we can find a lot of scripture to support that. But the powers that be, the idea of government is something that God has ordained. He has decreed that that should exist, that that is good to be in place. Verse number two, he says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Whoa. So he says here that if you fight against government, if you fight against authority in your life, not just government but all god-given authority if you fight against that god will hold you to account for that you're bringing to yourself damnation from this side and the other side from the government side because if you resist the government what happens you get punished right and if you resist the government god is going to deal with you as well one way or another god's going to hold you to account for that Whosoever therefore, um, I'm sorry, verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. I like that verse number five. He says, don't just be, don't just do the right thing because it keeps you out of trouble. Do the right thing just simply because it's the right thing to do. He continues on verse number six. He says, for this cause, pay ye tribute also. You know what tribute is? It's taxes. Ugh. You know, I love the Bible. There are some verses that I would just really, I, I, I wish that it weren't there, you know? It's like, oh man, why did God put that there? Now I have to do that. He says, for this cause, pay ye tribute. Also pay your taxes. Also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So God in the New Testament tells us that this government thing that he set up back in Genesis chapter 9 It's important, it's significant, and Christians should obey the powers that are placed over them as though we were obeying God himself because God created this thing that we call government. Whatever the structure is, whatever the um, socialist, capitalist, communist, all of that, God has created governments and man chooses what we do Uh, from that point, how that government is expressed, how that government operates. But he tells us here, government's a good thing. Why? Because it's a necessary thing. We need it. If you don't have government, what happens? Genesis 6 happens. 
We need it in place. It's a necessary thing. But let me hasten to say this. It is a necessary evil as well. It is a necessary evil as well. Not because it's wrong by itself. God created the idea of government, so it's a good thing in that sense. But it is occupied, it is run, it is led by sinful people. And so since it's led by imperfect people, wrong things are going to happen. Wrong decisions are going to be made. And I'm just going to tell you this, teenagers, adults, government is not to be trusted. It is to be obeyed. It is not to be trusted. Ask those who lived in communist Russia for all those years if they could trust their government. Not so much. Ask those living in China today, can they trust their government? No, not so much. Look at the the stats, the numbers on it. 100 million people taken from the face of this earth because of communism. And it was in the 20th century, communism uh, was put in second place as far as the killer of human beings. Second place, second only to disease. It killed almost more people than disease did. Government is a good thing, but it can also be a really evil thing. It can be a terrible thing when it does not live and behave and move and decree according to truth, according to the bedrock of Scripture. Now, I'm not interested in having a government that is some sort of theocratic thing where um, the government uh, just does what the church says to do. I think we've seen how that plays out in history. Ask the people of Iran how that's working out for them to have a theocracy. Ask the people who lived under the Spanish Inquisition uh, how it was to live, to have the government being told what to do by the church. I think there's plenty of scripture about that as well. But we need to understand that government exists because man is sinful and so let's be careful not to trust the sinful men who are running the government let's be careful about that because we could really be hurting ourselves by doing that and hurting other innocent people as well even in the best government even in the best structure there's still a germ of danger still a little piece of danger embedded within it because man needs his sinfulness restrained That's why government exists, right? To restrain people's sinfulness. And so a government that lives unrestrained will be increasingly sinful, right? Even government needs restraint placed upon it because it is occupied by men who need their sinfulness to be restrained. So I'm trying to be real clear this morning so that there's no bad conversations, no difficult conversations after the service here today. So I want you to just think with me about this here today. What God is saying here is not that government is to run people's lives, that we are to live under the thumb of some totalitarian regime. He's saying the purpose of the government is to protect the innocent, not to take advantage of the innocent, not to abuse the innocent. And there always has been a problem with government even in scripture remember there was a day when the people of Israel came to Samuel the prophet and said we need a king and Samuel said you need to just slow up for just a minute here you need to think this through because if you get a king he's going to put your sons into the army he's going to force them to go out and bleed and die um, for wars that you might not agree with He's going to put your daughters into his service in his his palace and he's going to boss them around and tell them what to do. He's going to make you pay taxes and you don't get to decide how much those taxes are. Are you sure you want this? And they said, yes, we want a king because everybody else has a king. And what happened? Exactly what Samuel said. They were in perpetual war. The women were degraded and and treated poorly, and they lived under taxation, so much so that when uh, Solomon's son came to the throne, the people rebelled against Solomon's son, Rehoboam, because they were paying too much taxes. Everything that Samuel said came to pass because government became unrestrained. There were no checks and balances placed against that authority. If you see a leader 
who doesn't want accountability and who pushes against accountability, you need to get away from that leader. There's danger there. A, a good leader should want accountability around them. They should want somebody to have their eyes on what they're up to and what they're doing so because it's a protection against it's a protection for himself and it's a protection for everyone else. In America, we try to protect ourselves from all this stuff by creating what we call the consent of the governed, right? The consent of the governed, that the people are ruled in America because we choose to be ruled. That things happen in our country based upon people's, the, the general population's approval of it. So we elect representatives and senators and presidents and things like that, and that is our way of giving our consent to be governed. Let me just uh, show you this this morning, then we will move on, um, because I just think this is so important. This is so relevant, especially with everything going on in the news right now. This is so important for us to think about and think through, okay? There's two Latin words that, it, that show up in uh, when you're studying government and history and things like that. One of them is rex and the other is lex. Rex and lex. Lex is the Latin word for law. Rex is the Latin word for king. And so you can have two kinds of governments. You can have a rex lex government or a lex rex government. In a uh, rex lex government, the king is the law. And that's what we see throughout history, where the king, he was the law. What he said went. He was not held accountable. He wasn't placed under law himself. And what happened? Horrible, horrible things. Throughout the 20th century, that's what we see in communism and Nazism and things like that, fascism, people's lives being absolutely destroyed because of a leader who just willed it so, who just willed it to be. And that's what happened. But in America, we tried it a little different. Instead of saying Rex Lex in America, we live under Lex Rex, where law is king. Law is king. Where even the leaders are to be held to account for what the law says. The idea simply being that the leaders are supposed to live under the same laws that the people live under. And when that happens, it works well. When it happens, it works well because nobody would want to make the weapon by which they themselves could be wounded, right? So in a Lex Rex government, the people are being treated no worse than the people who are in leadership because we're all living by the same rules, supposedly. By the way, I wonder how those senators and representatives are liking their marketplace health care plan uh, today. Um, but anyways, that's a whole other story altogether. Um, but anyways, think about this with me. We're living in a different world than we did 20 years ago. We're living in a different America than we did 20 years ago. I was thinking about it last night. The young people who walk across the stage at Putnam County R1 today and receive their diploma will be probably the last graduating class that was alive when 9-11 happened. This... That era is over. That era of being awake to that stuff is, has passed. And even the ones who are graduating today, they don't remember what life was like before the Twin Towers fell. They don't remember what life was like before the, and I'm about to go into dangerous waters here, but before the government stepped in and said, we're going to keep you safer than you already are. You remember what it was like to go to the airport in 1999 versus 2002? You remember what that was, how different it is today? And I'm not saying commenting one way or the other on that. I'm just saying that we're living in a world that doesn't understand what that liberty, that amount of liberty looks like, what that amount of freedom looks like. And so we need to be, as Christians, standing with the government when it's doing the right thing, and standing against it when it's standing against God. Because what does he say in Romans 13? He says, government is to be a terror to evil, and it is to praise the good. When that doesn't happen, government's not fulfilling its God-given responsibility. And then Christians ought to stand up and say, hey, we're going to hold you to account for that. We're going to hold you to account for that. You can't act that way and get away with that. 
You can't do that and get away with that. Because when we don't do that, we have an unrestrained government, and an unrestrained government becomes a totalitarian government. When we say, just do whatever you want to do, just keep us safe, keep us happy, keep us fed. When we do that, we surrender everything to them. We're taking away all restraint, and we're putting ourselves in a bad place. By the way, you say, are you going to get back to the Bible at some point this morning? We will, I promise. But I think that there's plenty of history to prove what the Bible has said um, about this topic and about this issue. So anyway, why is God concerned with the punishment of murder? Why is God concerned with that? He tells us in verse number 6, look there, verse number 6, he says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. By the way, it's written right there in black and white. Government is to do that. Government is to be a punishing influence. And then he says at the end of the verse, For in the image of God made he man. Why is God concerned with it? Because the victim bears the image of God. To rob, uh, to, 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 to do that is to remove uh, an image bearer of God. And so this just reminds us, we need to think about this for a minute. Why do we make the laws that we make? Because they sound good? Probably, in truth, that's probably a lot of the reason why we make the laws that we make. But is there an undergirding principle? Is there a foundational principle, a compass by which we steer our, our lives and our governance to say, Why are we making this rule in the first place? Just to punish these people over here and make these people feel good? Or because it sounds like a good thing to do? God says, I'm decreeing this, I'm creating this government thing because man is in the image of God and that ought to be protected. It ought to be preserved. So God himself doesn't make a rule without having a reason for it. So we probably ought to think that way as well. By the way, Our founders got it right. Your rights and my rights are not granted to us by the government. They're granted to us at birth and before birth, in the womb, where life begins. It's granted to us in the womb by an almighty God. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These inalienable rights that are granted to us by our creator. The government doesn't get to give rights. The government doesn't get to take away rights. The government is meant to protect those rights. Right? That's what God's saying here. That's God's pattern. That's God's design for governance. And by the way, anything that wasn't given to you by God at birth isn't actually a right. If it wasn't granted to you by God, how can we say that that is a human right for me to have that if it wasn't given you by God. It's an extra. It's an addition. It's it's, it's gravy. It's a nice thing to have, but it's not an essential. Don't expect too much from government and don't give too much in return either. That's God's, uh, I think just to summarize this morning, that's God's statement on this issue. Then God makes a new covenant here. He makes a new covenant. Notice here he says, I'm going to to prove to you that life is precious and that life is special. He says, I'm going to put a bow in the cloud, a bow, a rain bow, something in the shape of an archer's bow with the manifold colors, Roy G. Biv, all that thing, all that stuff. He says, I'm going to put that in the sky and it's going to be a reminder to you. And he says, it's going to be an evidence. He says, I'm going to look at it from heaven. And he says, I will honor the covenant that I'm making with you that I will never remove Uh, life from this earth uh, in a worldwide flood of waters again. We talked about before a few weeks ago that there is coming a day when the world will be bathed in fire. But God promises here that life will be preserved uh, from a worldwide flood ever again. Mark Twain and his friend William Dean Howell stepped out of church one Sunday and a violent rainstorm began. And as they're standing there waiting Uh, for the the rain to stop. Howells said to Twain, he said, I wonder if it's going to stop. Twain replied, it always has. And because of God's promise, it always has. And it always will. God has honored that promise. He's honored that covenant because life is precious to him. But notice here, he says it's a a bow. It's an instrument of war uh, in this rainbow. But where is the bow pointed The danger, the business end of the bow is not pointed at earth. 
It's pointed at heaven. Because when God sees the bow, he knows and recognizes that sin must be paid for, but not this direction. Sin will be paid for from that direction. That the judgment hand of God did not fall on mankind at the cross of Jesus Christ. The judgment hand of God fell upon God himself. That heaven paid the price. Heaven paid the cost for man's sins when Jesus died on the cross that day. The danger of the bow is not pointed our direction. It is pointed towards God's direction as his way of saying that I will take care of the sins. I will judge the sins of mankind in and of myself. So apparently life's a pretty precious thing to God and ought to be pretty precious to us too. Proverbs chapter 24, verse number 10 The Bible says, If thou feign in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain. If thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not. Doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth he not know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? So he says here that if you want to be a follower of God, you need to speak up for the person who is at risk. You need to speak up for the life that is in danger. He says, if you forbear, if you withhold from delivering those that are drawn unto death, from those that are ready to be slain, he says, God will see it. God will know it. God will hold you to account for that. There's an old poem. I didn't bother to, to print it and bring it, but basically the idea is pretty simple, that I didn't, this, he's speaking in the context of Nazi Germany, and he says, I didn't uh, bother when the government went after the labor unions because I wasn't in a labor union. I didn't bother when they went after the, uh, the, 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 the communists because I wasn't a communist. I didn't speak up for the Jews when they went after the Jews. I didn't speak up for the churches when they went after the churches because I wasn't a Jew and I wasn't a Christian. But then when they came after me, there was no one left to speak up for my case. He's, that's what God's saying here. Speak up for those who have no voice. Stand up for those who have no way of speaking on their own and defending themselves. That is what the role of government is to be. And if the government's not doing that, by golly, the Christians certainly ought to be doing that and being a voice for those who are without a voice. Can we pray together? Lord, I want to thank you for this day. I thank you for your goodness and your grace. God, you are so good to us. And Lord, you are the judge of all the earth. And you will require justice. But you poured out all that wrath and all of that vengeance and justice upon yourself. You paid the price when Jesus died on the cross so that we don't have to. Lord, if we ignore it, if we uh, don't accept what Jesus has done for us, then we will be held to account for it. We will have to face the judgment hand of God. But, Lord, the promise from your word is that, that any that come to Jesus Christ in faith will be saved, that whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we thank you for that because you are a God that loves human life, that loves the life of this earth. And, Lord, we pray that as Christians that that would be our heartbeat. That would be our desire to see a preservation of life because every person that enters this world is made in the image of Almighty God, just like we are. And so they're precious, they're special, they matter. There is no junk person upon this earth. There is no person who is garbage upon the face of this earth. Every one of them matters to you because within that person is a soul which will spend eternity somewhere. Lord, help us to keep that in mind when we're dealing with difficult people. We're dealing with people that disagree with us. and We're dealing with uh, even enemies. Lord, help us to remember that that person matters in the sight of an almighty God. Help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed today, if you're here and you say, Pastor Brian, I know I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven. And I can tell you why from the Bible. Would you just slip your hand up there as a testimony this morning? Amen. Amen. If you were unable to raise your hand, can I tell you this? God wants you to know, and we'd love to show you today, how to know that heaven is your home. Why don't you just come forward during the invitation and get my attention. Let's talk about that today. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Brian, I know I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven. But God's dealing with me today about something. 
God speaking to my heart. Maybe something we talked about in the message, maybe something completely different. But you say, Pastor Brian, pray for me because God's speaking to me today. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up there? Amen, amen, amen. Hands around the room. Praise the Lord. We're going to sing a song of invitation together. Uh, Jan and Marty are going to come back and lead us in I Have Decided to Follow Jesus, hymn 635. And uh, we have no allegiance greater than our allegiance to Jesus Christ. He is our maker. He's our master. And so we want to follow him above all else. Hymn 635, we're going to sing this hymn of invitation. And if God spoke into your heart, I would invite you to come forward. I'll be down front if you need someone to speak with you or pray with you about something. But whatever the need of your heart is today, as we sing this song, hymn 635, if God's spoken to you, would you come? Would you please stand? God, we come to you today and we thank you for our leaders. We thank you for the country that we get to live in. God, what a blessing it is to live in the United States of America and to call her home. Uh, Lord, she's flawed. There are many things that need to be corrected and dealt with. But Lord, for all of her warts and for all of her problems, God, it's still a blessing to be here. Still the greatest country upon the face of this earth. And we thank you so much for the blessing that it is to be an American. And Lord, I pray that we would, as Christians, teach our young people where it came from and how much it needs to be protected. It's upon every generation to, uh, to stand for and to protect and to use the liberties uh, that, you have, that we have been granted to us and allowed uh, to us. And so, Lord, I pray that we would continue to have that heartbeat. We pray for our rulers, our leaders today. We pray for our president and our leaders in the House of Representatives, those in the Senate, those in the judiciary, uh, those in our local government and state government. We pray for each and every one of them, God, that you would put your hand of protection upon their lives or that you would preserve them from those that want to do them harm. And Lord, we pray for wisdom upon them. We pray that you'd, uh, for the, the believers in government, we thank you for each and every one of them. We pray for more. Uh, to get involved, and Lord, we pray that you would uh, just give them great wisdom to speak the truth uh, in, a, in a kind and truthful and compassionate way. And Lord, we also uh, pray for those that don't know Christ, that the gospel would get to them, that they might be saved. And Lord, uh, we pray for wisdom for them as well. And uh, Lord, we pray for our nation right now. What a time of divisiveness and polarization and anger, where it seems like even the simplest disagreements become fights. Um, in our nation today and God it's just not a healthy place to be Lord help us to stand with one another to stand uh, for each other and uh, God we just pray for your hand of protection upon our country in the years to come and Lord we thank you that you have created something like government to, per to preserve and protect your people and we thank you that here in the United States we get to enjoy um, the liberties that we have the, the freedom to worship the freedom to be a Christian in the public square and to not be afraid uh, to say that we're a follower of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would bless our church in the days ahead. Help us as we reach out into our community with the saving message of Jesus Christ. I pray for the needs that are represented here in this room today. And we pray that you would bless each and every one uh, that's carrying a burden. And uh, God, just bring relief to their hearts today. And uh, God, we pray for your blessing now as we continue. In Jesus' name, amen. I mean, you can be seated there for just a minute. I want to share with you a couple of announcements uh, here today, some things uh, coming up. 
And uh, so don't forget that uh, we don't have lunch or a 1 p.m. service today because of graduation. Uh, so hope that you'll uh, be able to attend that today. Um, but next week, we should be back on our normal routine next week once we get um, uh, out of today. So then Wednesday is our closing program for True Trackers. Uh, we're going to be passing out awards uh, for verse memorization, devotions, attendance, things like that on this Wednesday night. So hope to see you out for that, parents. And we're also going to give them a small meal like normal, uh, but we're going to have our Sundays on Wednesday. We're going to do some ice cream uh, snacks for all the kids on Wednesday. And if you come, adults, there might be a little leftover for you too. Just a, a little incentive for you to show up on Wednesday night, all right? But uh, then we've got junior and teen camps coming up. Don't forget that we've got the forms, the registration forms on the table in the back. Let's try to get those in um, as soon as we can, um, and I'd like to have those in by mid-June if we could do that, um, and we'll have time for others as well that need to trickle in later, but if you know that your young person is going uh, to junior camp or teen camp, if you could get that back to me before mid-June, uh, that would be great. Um, and then how about uh, birthdays to recognize? Anybody got a birthday? Oh, 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 all right, when is it? The 23rd. All right. How old? Too old. All right. All right. Well, happy birthday to Dakota. Anybody else? Anniversaries. Oh, yeah. All right. You have the, the twofer here today. All right. Wonderful. When is that? The 20th. Awesome. Well, congratulations. How many years? Too many. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along. Just kidding. I can, I can I can go on record and say he loves you. It's okay. You know, we're everything's five years. Wonderful, wonderful. All right. Anybody else? All right. Well, you guys stop by the resource center and uh, Dakota. I'm going to help you go back there and pick one or two out. All right. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Happy birthday. What's that? <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. She's a nice lady. She's. It's going to be great. <laughs> okay. All right. Anyways. Um, and then also, um, one other thing I do need to announce today. Heather, did you want to talk about um, the shower in June? They, they, I guess they had to go. All right, so June 9th, um, 1 p.m., if not a little bit earlier. Sometimes we get done a little early. Um, Target and Amazon, that would be great. Be a blessing to them as they have their first little one. All right, so Molly, would you uh, come join me up here for just a minute? Today, uh, Molly has got a big milestone today. Uh, she is graduating today, getting her degree. So before they give you your stuff, I'm going to give you the church's uh, presentation right there. We'll get for you there, and also um, a copy of the One Year Bible, just a good um, Bible reading tool. Um, so keep that uh, keep that going um, while you're in college. And uh, we're thankful for Molly and uh, the blessing that she is around here and to um, our homes. And uh, she does a lot for our church, um, even just as a, as a young person now, 19 years old. Right? Awesome, awesome. So um, we're thankful uh, to have her here. And tell everybody what what's next for you. Very good. I think that's a good choice for Molly Parker, don't you think? Uh, nursing would be a great career choice for her. Well, we look forward to seeing you walk across the stage and getting the, the thing you really want today, right? So, very good. Well, you can be seated. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to stand together and uh, pray and dismiss here. And uh, we're going to pray for Molly and for others. Are there any other family members that you might have that's graduating or have graduated recently, high school, college? Who? Okay, great. Anybody else? Another family member or close friend? That All right, pretty quiet then. All right, well, let's pray, and we'll be dismissed. And uh, Brother Altizer, would you pray for us and make sure to, to pray for Molly today as well?